Hi there! Welcome to No Extra Words, the Flash Fiction Podcast. My name is Chris Baker Dirsch. I'm your producer and editor. Today's special episode is part of our Meet the Authors interview series. We had a promotion back in January where we drew at random the name of a contributor who had shared a short story with us on the show. And each of those four contributors won a few prizes, one of which was an interview feature. So this is interview number three. We've already talked to Nels Hansen and Sarah Mitchell Jackson. Today, we feature Mary Alice Long. Mary Alice Long contributed the story Wild Ones to episode 33 back in February. So when she refers in the interview to the naked biker story, you got to go back and hear Wild Ones because it is truly one of a kind. Mary got on with me via Skype and after a couple of connection difficulties and one quick trip to the store, to get $2 headphones. She and I had a chat that ran a little bit long, but I want to share it with you because we talk about gory fairy tales and writing inspiration and librarian action figures and we totally blow the doors off of the Star Wars franchise. It was a wonderful chat and I hope you enjoy my conversation with Mary Alice Long here on the No Extra Words podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in to the No Extra Words podcast, a very special author interview edition with one of our Contributor Appreciation Month winners. I have on the line with me via Skype, Mary Alice Long. Mary, how are you today? I'm wonderful now that we are functioning. Thank you. <laughs> we had a little bit of technology issue there getting this started, but you know what? It's all good. It's all we're we're here now. We're talking. So I'm going to start by asking you just tell us about yourself, your life, your life as a writer, who you are. I grew up in California. I left San Diego after college to go to South Florida for some more college, and now I live in Colorado Springs where I'm working. At a college. <laughs> can't seem to get away from college. <laughs> can't, yeah, can't get away. I did my Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing at Florida Atlantic University, which is something that I'm very happy that I chose to do because it helps with the old writing thing. <laughs> That's cool. That's always nice to hear because I always, you know, I, I go back and forth on, I think I'm in a phase of my life where I'm past the MFA window. Like, I don't think I can do that to my family now, but I always wonder, you know, how that, how that has a, you know, impact on your writing. So it's nice to hear that it felt like it was worth it to you. Yeah, it was a very energizing writing community, a lot of support and just learning how to be embedded in the thing. So if I, if you're feeling short circuited, it's like, well, figure out what replenishes you go read this kind of stuff. Don't read to the point of distraction, but to the point of refueling, which has been really helpful for me since I tend to get very distracted <laughs> I need refueling. So that's also, you I make mean, it sound almost like it's like a, a writer's residency, like a, you know, that kind of community feeling. That's how it felt for me. I was okay. very happy to be there. Yeah. And I'm just curious because college is such a huge part of your life. What is your undergraduate degree in? English. <laughs> so. Nice. Nice. Very nice. I feel like people who get English degrees either want to teach or want to write or want to do both. So I actually just had no idea what to do when I was doing my undergrad. I did two years of undeclared schoolwork, and they were basically like if you would like to continue going to school and keep that financial aid, you should probably pick a degree. And I said, oh, I'm doing okay in this one. I have a very similar story. I got two years into my undergraduate degree and I like they were going to kick me out if I didn't have a major. And so I, I remember going home and telling my dad and stepmother, I'm going to take four classes and I'm just going to major in my favorite class. And my stepmother was like, please let it not be theater. Please let it not be theater. And it was political science, which was every bit as useless as theater. So oh, yeah. very, I, when I started college, I thought I will get a theater degree. And then <laughs> that fell by the waist died in the first year I was there so but it's harder than people think yeah it was strange too it was like, like one of the few things I remember about uh high school I guess was how welcoming the theater community was and how easy it was to be part of that community and when I started college it didn't seem like that at all it seemed very shut off and I just didn't have the perseverance at the time to elbow my way in there so it left me free to explore some other options. And it 
sounds like you found the writer community, at least the writer community in your MFA program, to be a lot less of that. Because I think creative people right. kind of get that rep sometimes that, like, it's a closed club. And if you don't have this kind of publication or this kind of theater credit or this kind of whatever, you're not in. And it sounds like you didn't get that in an MFA program. So that's another good thing to hear. Yeah, I was very thrilled to have the cohort of writers that I had. I think I got very lucky. Very cool. What inspires you as a writer? What are some inspirations of yours? Sometimes, so in the case of the story that you were kind enough to broadcast, podcast for me. Sure, pick a word. Yeah, one of those. I, I think I woke up with a song, that song stuck in my head because the night before my friend and I had been discussing the Marlon Brando film, uh, oh my gosh, Wild, The Wild Bunch, I'm going to forget. Um, and there's there's a Simpsons episode where Homer wants to be in a bike gang and they call themselves the Hell Satans and then the actual bike gang by that name shows up and just sort of ruins that whole thing. So sometimes I think conversation about all of the random stuff that collides in the old brain pan kicks me into wanting to write about it instead of continuing to put my friends through the paces of listening to me talk about it. If that makes sense. I love how it literally came from a song stuck in your head because who hasn't had a song stuck in their head? Um, and, and that combined with some other wonderful pop culture influences all meshes together and makes a short story. That's awesome to me. Yeah, there are ways to exercise the... <laughs> The things that get stuck in your brain, you know, if they're rolling around for a while. I also, I think in my secret life, I'll become an inventor. I have all of these ideas for companies and restaurants and items, and none of them are probably very practical. And so sometimes (laughs) I think instead of entertaining the notion that you will actually ever do this, why don't you write about the scenario in which it's possible and then you will feel less accomplished about it. I'm suddenly wondering if George Lucas ever wanted to start a restaurant and that's where that cantina scene comes in in Star Wars because it's this very real place. You just discovered the whole scene of the Star Wars franchise. I feel like there's a... 79% that's true oh that's awesome that is so cool (laughs) that is so because like you know you 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 want to start this restaurant or start this business and you you can't because this is the real world so you just stick it in a story and write a whole world around it oh like mind blown now yes (laughs) (laughs) I have another piece I've been working on forever and who knows if it will ever get finished but it basically started from a conversation with my dad where I was like they should just We should invent food that's, like, available in bulk, but high nutrients, like dog food, but for people? And he said no one would buy this. And I was like, no, no, no. It's all about the marketing and what you call it and what you include in it. And so that has spiraled into a very long (laughs) story. completely awesome. I like taking a conversation and saying, P.S., I'm going to steal this part of it and go – make something out of it. I hope you're okay with that person or persons with whom I was talking. (laughs) Just know that nothing you say to me you could ever hold within your own copyright because I reserve the right to steal that line and write a short story about it. That's awesome. Exactly. Do you... Do you do mostly short stories? Do you what I kind do. of um okay, mostly short stories. And we do short short stories on this podcast and I always mm-hmm. love to ask people what about that short short story form appeals to you? Like how did you get started in that sort of really short story world? I think that since a lot of the ideas that I have for writing tend to be these quick very short things, it's nice to have a structure, a format in which it could uh, what what which accommodates that. So if I'm like, <laughs> um, th- so the story I submitted to the, to you, the wild ones, I laughed over this joke in my head for probably like a week about this naked biking rolling into town <laughs> and just kept telling people what would, th- <laughs> can you imagine what this would be like? And you're like, okay, sure. I guess that sounds like a thing. Um, but that doesn't, that for me didn't lead into a very long story there unless I wanted to follow that bike gang around the country but I feel like that that was more than I wanted to invest in that particular 
sort of right. joke, personal right. joke that I couldn't stop laughing at. So, and <laughs> and it's nice to be like, hey, you should be able to get this done in a couple of pages. If it's going more than that, you've probably worn out the idea as welcome. Don't beat it to death. So nice. I like a I like a little flash or the very the, the short short. It's com it's comfortable. <laughs> it's a very yeah. comfortable form, I think. And I love the fact that you compare it to a joke. Like I have this same thought, like really good storytelling, even if it's not funny necessarily, it almost has this kind of wind up to like and you know, if somebody's telling a joke, you know, and then this happens and then this happens and then there's the kind of punch to it and then you're done. Like then you're done and you get to walk away. Yeah. And sometimes the thrill of being put through those sort of joke paces, right? The escalation and the denouement, however you want to call it, the, the catharsis. The Spoken the like thing. a true English major. Sure, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it feels so good to read a piece like that and to be really affected by something that can just punch into you and then, and then it's over. <laughs> I think it leaves room for thinking space about stuff for me when I feel stuck in writing I like to read flash and short shorts because you can see how much somebody can accomplish in such a short space and mm -hmm. it feels very motivating like like going on a well that's not true because I don't run I play roller derby but sprinting is not really one of my things that I do but I imagine for someone out there that like a very fast <laughs> Rent is really satisfying as opposed to running a marathon. Now I'm in a metaphor that I know nothing about, so I'm going to rein it back in. I don't know. I, I've, I've seen some roller derby, and there's stuff going on there that looks like sprinting to me for whatever we do, works. we do sprinting. We do sprinting on, on skates, but it doesn't feel like that to me because we're always going in a circle or an oval. <laughs> so it's not like, hey, I just made it from my house to the supermarket in – four minutes it's like hey i made it around the track uh this quickly which is nice <laughs> but i don't know how to compare that to writing sorry but i feel like this is your next goal is to like make a nice writing roller derby metaphor i'd love to read that i would <laughs> so you mentioned a little bit about you like to read flash fiction talk about you as a reader a little bit sure i've been going back through a bunch of feminist um, science fiction. I got a really killer anthology, um, Sisters of the Revolution, a feminist speculative fiction anthology. So, yeah, it, I, I never even knew some of the authors in here, so I've been really excited about that. But, yeah, I like speculative fiction. I just read a biography of James Hickory Jr., which was very moving to be embedded in the life of that writer. Um, I don't usually read a lot, a lot of biographies, but I made an exception for that one. What else do I like to read? Um, Jonathan Lifham. I go back to, or, to some things, like, um, like paper bag horror sometimes, just to see how much someone can get away with. <laughs> really extravagant descriptions and have it still pull a story through. I've been trying to get a friend to read this Robert McCammon novel called Stinger <laughs> or and Swan Song uh, for a while. And he's like, it's just, uh... and I was like, yeah, I don't really, I can't put my finger on what makes it so good to me. I think it's just incredibly fast paced and it has so many characters and yet they're all still connected to each other. And I think there's something to be said for, plot and character, even if the, whatever you would call, like, the, 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 the highfalutinness of the writing isn't there, it's comforting. It's like, I can tackle this in lots of different voices. I don't know. I think, sorry to go on, but... No, go on. I, I, I'm a librarian. You can talk to me about what you're reading for forever. I love it. I think that sometimes when you're trying to publish or get whatever you're thinking about out there, there's still that back of the head MFA voice or whoever's voice about like literary value, mm -hmm. like the literary content of your work. And because I think good stories come from so many different places, sometimes I like to see how successful something can be without being worried about the, I don't know, the highfalutin. <laughs> <laughs> 
I love any, that. Any, I, I love that. That's kind of one of the reasons I started the podcast is I felt like the short stories that I write and the short stories that I like reading aren't really literary in a traditional sense. And so there wasn't a place for them. Like the world is full of literary journals, but where's the sort of more plain spoken? So I, one of my librarian idols is a lady named Nancy Pearl, and she talks about there's four ways readers connect to story. And one is character, one is plot, one is setting, and one is writing. And, you know, everybody connects a little bit to all of those, but there's kind of a main door for most readers of what they gravitate towards. Oh, I would like to read that. <laughs> she just, she she's a, she, she's a librarian rock star here in Seattle is the best way to explain Nancy Pearl. Ooh. At some point she discovered how to make a living by just talking about books. Like she writes books about books and she goes on cruises and talks about books to people and gets paid to do it. And I'm not really sure how she's an action figure. Like if you ever find in, in like a what? silly, Right. If you're ever wandering through a toy store, like it tends to happen in those hipster type toy stores. I don't know if you have those in Colorado, but in Seattle we do. And you'll see like a librarian action figure and she shushes. That's Nancy Pearl. (gasps) And she's like, she's, yeah, she's a total librarian rock star. So thank you so much for this information. (laughs) (laughs) This is part of my week next week. (laughs) Nice. That's very exciting. Nice. But yeah, I, I totally dig that concept that sometimes there's something to be said for a story, even that you didn't expect to enjoy. <laughs> sometimes it's some creep in on you. And I think that happens in music a lot, too. If, you know, like a good narrative song, even if I'm not really into the background music, I might listen a lot because of the story for the yeah, all that jazz, you know? Yeah, I think everybody I know who's not a country music fan always says, I'm not a country music fan, but there's this one song. Like, And I think that's true of a lot of genres. There's that one song that you're like, I forgive you for being some kind of music that I hate because I love the lyrics and I love the rhythm. And so I just, yeah. So and I think story is the same way. That's awesome. And I have to ask this question because I am a children's librarian. What were some of your favorite books when you were a kid? Oh, my goodness. So I'm going to admit that I have read more books, children's books probably that I keep in my heart as an adult than I remember from being a child, if that makes any sense. But <laughs> so, like Nobody's Family is Gonna Change by Louise Fitzhugh is one of my all time favorite books. But I didn't read that until college and I wish that I had read it as a child. I think child Mary would have very much appreciated that book. <laughs> but um I read all of the Little House on the Prairie and the Nancy Drew books when I was wee because my I think my grandma gave me those sets. Yeah. Um, my grandpa used to read. Oh gosh, it's probably I haven't looked at it in years. It's probably so racist. He read, <laughs> read me like um, the story of these like seven Chinese brothers, and each one could only be killed in a certain fashion, and oh, yeah. people were always trying to kill them, but it. Would, be like, oh, so they drowned him, but that was the brother that couldn't drown. And I thought that story was the bees and knees when I was a kid and as an adult. I was like, oh, I'm, I might not want to reread that. <laughs> no, maybe it will tarnish my memory of it. As you're talking, I'm like, I know, I know this story. And I'm thinking in my head, like, when I first got into children's librarianship, I feel like that book, that story was a lot of places and I haven't seen it in a long time. So I wonder if, like, in that time, it has kind of fallen out of favor because I haven't read it in a long time either. So I don't really know how bad it actually actually is that's 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 gonna be my homework because i'm gonna have to go check that yeah one out, so. i'm also gonna do this and just see what happens it's fine there are things we can let go as we get older i'm sure right. but then you have to let go <laughs> into the deep under. like oh i loved that and it was really terrible because i was a kid and had no taste it's okay yeah i'm hoping that's not the case but who knows i on my we had some big like uh actually my mom just gave these to me the last time i was home they're big books of fairy tales and they're the, I guess, more traditional versions of fairy tales. So one story that I always really liked was one about, it's kind of a Cinderella, Cinderella-y one, but it's about a gal that goes to the well to get water for her, like, terrible stepmother and sister, and she meets an old lady at the well, and the old lady says, can you bring me up some water? And she's like, sure, and gets her the good water, you know, from the bottom of the well. And the gal, the old lady sends her home, and she gets home, and she's like, oh, diamonds and, like, flowers are falling out of my mouth every time I speak. So they send the second sister to the well, like, oh, my gosh, look at this. We don't, one person dropping diamonds out of their mouth isn't enough. We should have two daughters that can do that. And the second daughter gets 
to the well and totally blow, she's looking for an old lady. So the lady that shows up is looks younger, I guess. <laughs> Gets her like the nasty water off the top. So the lady sends her home and the daughter is like, Hey, I met that lady. But then just like lizards and frogs and all these things fall out of her <laughs> house. And so the story as a whole, I mean, you know, the gal with the flowers and jewels coming out of her mouth immediately gets swept up by some prince because who wouldn't like, right. hey, jewels fall from your lips when you speak. I think we should get hitched. But right. I really love the idea of somebody talking and just reptiles falling out of their mouth with every single word. So that image, so nice. I still really enjoy that. Sorry. Traditional fairy tales are gory. Like there's a great book that just came out in the past couple of years called it's a tale dark and grim and it's a children's book, but it's like, it's got all those traditional fairy tales in it, but they're based on the real, like, you know, instead of Hansel and Gretel getting away, Gretel has to cut off her finger and open the door and like all of this, you know, stuff that's in those original versions that we forget because Disney took them out for us. And the book is great because it's so aimed at like nine and 10 year old kids. And it'll say like, now the part of the story where we have to make sure there are little kids out of the room. Like, did you kick your little brother out of the room? Bye-bye, little brother. And then it goes back to tell this story. Because I think kids kids dig that. Like, the whole idea yes. that, like, her finger is dripping blood and lizards are falling out of her mouth. And, like, they're gross, a lot of those stories. So <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And who doesn't like some gross stuff? It's really nice. Now is the question where you get to dream about your future. So what are your writer dreams? Like, in a perfect world, in five or ten years or more, what does your writing life look like? In a perfect world, I would spend more time doing it, making as opposed to I'm going to do it right. I have 15 minutes. I'll do it right now. That's fine. I appreciate being able to try and crank something out in 15 minutes, but to have some more space in which to do it would be nice. I'd really like to finish this long story about the people dog food <laughs> because. My longest work at this point was, a, is, I guess, wait, like a, a very long story or a novella, and it'd be nice to finish the novel form, the long, <laughs> I don't know. I never thought I would, so when I found myself sort of in the middle of one, I thought, oh, gosh, <laughs> what have you done? You set out to be a short story writer, and this thing is just spiraling out of control, so... I mean, while I would like people to be reading some of my wacky ideas about stuff, I'm not entirely sure what that will look like in five fair. years. Totally fair. And I, when I ask this question, like, what people say almost invariably is the stuff they want to create. It really it has to do with readers, sure, and the time to write more, but it's all about, like, the drive to put more of your stuff out there, which I think is awesome. Like, the motivation is pure. I think I just sometimes I feel like there are so many ideas and I can only get so much of one out. And sometimes then, you know, an idea doesn't pan out at all. You think naked biking and you start to write it and you just say, oh, no, no, that has no legs. Like, I, I can't I can't run with this. And then sometimes you're like, no, I feel like I have 20 ideas right now that all have legs and I'd like to see where they go. But I should probably finish anything before I do. My secret shame is my drawer full of story begins. Right? Yeah. I don't think it's a shame. I think it's wonderful because sometimes when you feel stuck in something, you can take a break and go start something new. It's just hard to go back, I think. But and I'm also very tempted toward the constant like the the longest revision process ever. <laughs> like sometimes I feel very comforted by trying to make something better rather than trying to finish something else. And I know that that's a, just a distraction sometimes too, but sometimes it works out. Like I have been trying for years to revise another story. And the other night I had like a whole epiphany about that piece. And I thought, Oh my gosh, you've been tackling this from the wrong angle for years. Like, <laughs> But it is good. I'm happy to have had that thought. And I look forward to going back and seeing if that actually helps it get completed. <laughs> That, yeah. And I hear people say that, that revision after a while can be a distraction. But I also, I am of the opinion that we live in a world with not enough revision in it. So, like, I I kind of think that a few more people could err more on the side of more intense revision processes. That's my opinion. My first master's is in women's studies, and I really am pulled toward writing uh, about things that I think will encourage people to think about ways of seeing the world. 
which I think everybody does, right? Like, that's no special <laughs> thing on my part. But as more issues of social justice, like, come up, I get very motivated to tackle different ones, <laughs> if that makes yeah. sense. So, so yeah. sometimes, in, and especially in the revision process, like, the way that I might have thought about something a few years ago may have shifted entirely as, you know, the world has unfolded. And I think, oh, you know, you really, the heart of this story is in a different place. Somewhere if else. what you want to talk, yeah, if what you want to talk about is like this particular, you know, <laughs> um, concern, world concern, I don't know, but in minutia, yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's good because the world does keep changing. The world is not a static place. And so, you know, your writing has to be a living thing. Otherwise it's not working. I have one final question. This is the part where okay. you get to brag about yourself. So tell okay. us if there's anything you're promoting or anything that's out that we should check you out at, and also how we get a hold of you and find out more about you. Oh, well, I'm very uh, poor at self-promotion, apparently. I don't have any self-dedicated site to <laughs> at the moment for writing. I will probably have to work on that. I do have... A couple of stories with um, Bedlam Publishing, aka like their online journal is called Loud Zoo, and they are super interesting, progressive, radical writing folks that I just dig. Their sixth volume came out a couple of months ago, and I was very impressed with all of the work therein. Not, <laughs> I'm very impressed with my own work. That's, I was very impressed with everybody else's work and very flattered to be <laughs> stuck in it. That's so. It's always nice when your own work gets included with cool stuff. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's the, and that's how very much how I feel about being um, included on No Extra Words. So thank you oh, thank for you. Uh, taking me on. Thank you. It was, it, it was a pleasure. If the pleasure was mine, if I have something set up in the near future, I will send it your way. <laughs> yeah, for no, for sure. Let me know because we can we can attach it to this. We can attach it to the notes of this recording. And I always <laughs> I like I like getting on Twitter and getting to talk about contributors to the show because af after a while my life gets kind of boring and I'm like, hey, we've got a contributor who has a new book or a new story or a new something. So I always said he'll send those to me because I you know I will make sure they get sent out at least through our channel so our listeners can hear about them too. So that's awesome. Thank you so much, Chris. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. I really, really enjoyed our chat, and I know we're going to hear more from you. So that's awesome. Thank you, and I look forward to hearing more of your stories. Oh, yes. Thank you so much. No Extra Words would like to thank Chanillo.com for their sponsorship of Contributor Appreciation Month and allowing us to reward our fabulous contributors. Chanillo.com, C-H-A-N-N-I-L-L-O.com is the web's best source for serialized literature. Visit them today, find out how you can subscribe to the right number of series for you and support writers, and let them know you appreciate them supporting your favorite podcast. Chanillo.com, that's C-H-A-N-N-I-L-L-O dot com.